Nuclear weapons are enormously important because they are currently the most destructive military instrument of the great powers, and they shape peace as much as they would shape war. The history of U.S. nuclear thought began almost immediately after the American dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The debate opened up between Bernard Brody, who was a naval historian who wrote the book The Absolute Weapon in 1946, and William Borden, who wrote a book There Will Be No Time, also in 1946, who worked within policy circles in Washington, D.C. Borden argued that nuclear weapons are simply bigger artillery. He's remembered by military specialists for his technically accurate predictions on missile developments. War is possible as long as leaders may come to believe that surprise is possible and inevitable between two great powers such as the US and the Soviet Union. War will involve simultaneous rapid rocket attacks across great distances, but eventually technology would be developed to permit rockets and energy beams to shoot down other rockets. Surveillance and launch would be mostly automatic. Here you can see a U.S. air-launched cruise missile. Key targets will be military, not cities, as precious nuclear resources will be used to destroy countervailing forces, or counterforce, in other words, targeting military assets, and cities will be left as hostages to the victor. The civilians will surrender when they lose the ability to fight. Why waste high-speed weapons against slow-moving targets like cities when slow attack systems such as bombers can deal with them later. Destroying New York City would not bring victory. City busting occurs after the battle is won. Industry does not matter because the speed of nuclear war relies on initial stockpiles and not ongoing production. Therefore, there should be no evacuation or dispersal of people from cities. The goal of nuclear war is to provoke the enemy to exhaust their own nuclear weapons on fortifications. Land armies would only be required in the unlikely outcome that the stalemate occurred, but this is unlikely. Missiles would be placed on dispersed submarines and ships, which would reduce the success of a first strike, and missiles would eventually replace bombers. Nuclear war is a tactical artillery exercise, and there is therefore no upper limit to the number of nuclear weapons required. Brody argued that nuclear weapons represented a fundamental change in international relations and war. He is strongly supported by academic proponents. He rejected the arguments of Borden. War is irrational because nuclear war will cause greater damage than any possible political gain except as a weapon of last resort against conquest. Nuclear weapons are strategic weapons and they have transformed warfare because there is no defense against them and therefore the destructions of one's cities are guaranteed. The focus therefore becomes one of avoiding the outbreak of war. Nuclear superiority is therefore non-existent. Nuclear weapons are difficult to locate and therefore surprise does not matter. Retaliation also does not have to be guaranteed, just likely, in order to be deterring. Sudden surprise attacks without prior indications of tensions also do not exist. Here you can see a US Skyvolt missile probably being loaded on the B-52 also in the picture. We often make a distinction between conventional weapons and non-conventional deterrents. Conventional weapons are aircraft, tanks, and ships versus non-conventional weapons, which are also termed weapons of mass destruction, which include toxicological weapons, biological weapons, chemical weapons, and finally nuclear weapons. In general, nuclear weapons are far more destructive than any of the other types of weapons of mass destruction. We've had significant experience of chemical weapons on the battlefield in the First World War, and there was significant planning for the use of chemical weapons dropped from the air in the 1930s leading up to the Second World War, but ultimately there was mutual deterrence. The British and Germans decided not to use chemical weapons against each other's cities. Now, nuclear weapons don't always deter. They will deter if they have second strike capability. In other words, if there's an attack, uh, 
on the nuclear arsenal. And the nuclear arsenal is able to survive because it's hidden or because it's mobile or because it's underwater or because it's inside a missile silo that's very uh, solidly uh, resistant. Uh, then you have deterrence because then these missiles, even though they've been attacked, enough of them survive to be able to be fired back and cause unacceptable damage on the country that initially launched the missile attack. So second strike capability has many different technical ways of being achieved, but it's a requirement. If a country has nuclear missiles out in the open that can be attacked by a first strike, then not only does this arsenal not contribute to deterrence, but it actually uh, creates instability. It creates circumstances which uh, 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 provokes uh, the opponent to fire first because you have a use it or lose it dilemma. Now nuclear weapons have a crystal ball effect. The amount of damage they cause is far more obvious than conventional weapons or even chemical or biological weapons. And therefore it's very easy for policymakers to understand the consequences of nuclear weapons. And the net consequence is nuclear deterrent forces tend both to deter crises from even occurring and once they do occur to stop their escalation and to de-escalate them before they become full-blown wars. While there were a number of confrontations and a major crisis in Cuba in 1962 between the United States and the Soviet Union, their mutual arsenals deterred each other from ever going to war. Now, nuclear weapons can contribute to instability, meaning they can give an incentive to one or the other party to using nuclear weapons that would lead to an outbreak of war, particularly if one or the other side lacks second strike capability. When one side has enough nuclear superiority to overcome the nuclear arsenal of the other, in other words, to destroy its arsenal in a first strike, and then has remaining weapons to threaten the other side, uh, then uh, you have instability because one side has an incentive to attack the other. So the most stable relationship are two deterrent forces in which neither si side has nuclear superiority. In general, it's very difficult to achieve nuclear superiority. You'd have to have a, an arsenal capable of simultaneously destroying missiles on bombers in the air, missiles dispersed at various airfields, missiles in silos, missiles on trucks and trains, and missiles underwater on submarines and on ships. And this is very difficult to coordinate. But if you do have two sides with nuclear weapons that have an unstable situation because they lack second strike capability, and this was the case with the US and the Soviet Union in the early 1950s when most nuclear weapons were simply kept in garages on the surface at airfields ready to be loaded onto bombers, this creates what's called the reciprocal fear of surprise attack. In other words, both of the countries realizing there's instability will take steps in order to fire their nuclear weapons first. And because each side is aware that the other side is trying to do this, there's a sudden fear of a surprise attack. And this can often escalate until one side feels the need to fire nuclear weapons to avoid being attacked first. Now, irrational leadership may also not be deterrable, even by nuclear weapons, although there's a very large debate as to what exactly it means to be irrational. States can actually pretend to be irrational. This is termed the rationality of irrationality. In a brinkmanship crisis where two countries are facing off against each other, it sometimes benefits one of the states to act a little bit crazy because then it compels the other country to back down and to give concessions. But it's dangerous if both sides pretend to be irrational then any basis for negotiation falls apart and uh, you're risking, in effect, uh, an acceleration towards a nuclear exchange. Another phenomenon is called perfect nuclear stability, also termed the stability instability paradox. This is when you've got two nuclear arsenals with second strike that face off against each other and the paradoxical outcome is they cancel each other out as if they never existed with the effect that it looks like they make war safe at the lower conventional level. 
And there are two classic examples of this. In 1969, China confronted the Soviet Union on their common border. China had detonated a small nuclear weapon in 1964 and it accumulated a small arsenal. The Soviet Union had a very large arsenal in 1969. But with a minimal deterrent, China felt confident enough to uh, challenge uh, the Soviets conventionally. There was a border clash. Uh, the Chinese instigated an ambush against Soviet border troops. The Soviets then used artillery against uh, Chinese ground forces. And it was shocking because it occurred between two major nuclear powers. And conventionally, you would think, well, this could escalate to a nuclear war. But in fact, it was two nuclear arsenals that cancelled each other out, making this conflict possible. The same phenomenon occurred in 1999. India and Pakistan had detonated nuclear weapons in 1998, and they then embarked on a conflict at the border at Kargil in Kashmir. Before this time, they had never engaged on this scale of a border conflict while they possessed nuclear weapons. So India and Pakistan hadn't actually exchanged this level of fighting since 1971. And then 1999, a year after the nuclear weapons were detonated, they confronted each other. So this is a, a paradoxical outcome, but some observers say that the stability and stability paradox does not exist. It's actually an illusion, and there are other domestic reasons why these countries clashed with each other and why the clashes didn't escalate. Another important observation is that there is a belief that you do not need large arsenals in order to deter. Some countries like France, England, and China have 300 nuclear warheads or less, and they feel confident. France was not able to destroy the Soviet Union during the Cold War. China would not be able to destroy the United States with its small arsenal, since most of those warheads can't even reach the United States. But having enough nuclear weapons to destroy the major cities of other countries seems to have a restraining effect. So even though China's got a small nuclear arsenal, they still behave like a great power. They still assert their interests. Now, there are technical problems that arise with nuclear arsenals. The first problem is the nuclear threshold credibility problem. If you have a large nuclear arsenal, but you don't have a very strong conventional force, then an adversary may try to exploit that difference by triggering a crisis at the conventional level. For example, North Korea invaded South Korea South Korea was supported by the United States, which had a large nuclear arsenal. North Korea didn't have a nuclear arsenal. Only a year before, the Soviet Union had detonated a nuclear weapon in 1949. Certainly not a big arsenal to back North Korea. But the U.S. conventional force was weak, so North Korea was encouraged to fight the United States. Now, the U.S. faced the same problem in Europe a few years later. The United States and the Soviet Union had very large arsenals. And the Soviet Union had a very large army, but the U.S. and NATO did not. So the solution here, in other words, to make credible the deterrent threat, is to introduce tactical nuclear weapons. In effect, to give nuclear weapons to the conventional armies. This is often called conventionalization. Uh, and what you can see here on the left is the Davy Crockett, which is the smallest nuclear launching system that the Americans deploy. Um, between uh, the early 1970s to the early 1980s. And you can also see on the right uh, a larger scale tactical battlefield nuclear system deployed by Pakistan. So in these cases, these countries can't be exploited because if you were to attack them with your stronger conventional force, you would then face tactical nuclear weapons. In fact, half of all nuclear weapons ever manufactured were manufactured for tactical battlefield use, not city destruction. So these are atomic demolitions munitions, which are backpack nukes, nuclear torpedoes, nuclear depth charges, nuclear air-to-air -air missiles, nuclear air-to-ground missiles, nuclear surface-to-surface -surface missiles, nuclear artillery, a wide variety of systems. Another problem in the logic of nuclear deterrence is missile defense. Missile defense 
typically consists of interceptor rockets that would fly up into the sky and blow up incoming nuclear missiles. On its face, it looks like it's a purely defensive system. And defense is good. You're not attacking with a defense, and so in theory it should increase stability. So if you have a strong defense, then the enemy has no incentive to attack you. Here in the picture you can see the US interceptors at Fort Greeley in Alaska. The other nuclear interceptor base the U.S. has is at, Fort, is at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. So here's the problem. If the United States, for example, builds a missile defense, it actually creates instability. Because the Soviet Union looks at the missile defense and says, okay, here's an American missile defense. It's not going to shoot down all of our missiles, but it's going to shoot down enough of our missiles. So what if the U.S. were to fire their nuclear missiles at the Soviet Union? It would come down and blow up a lot of Soviet nuclear missiles. And then whatever nuclear missiles the Soviets had that survived would then be fired back at the United States, but there'd be so few of them that they wouldn't get through the U.S. missile defense system. So then the Soviet Union is thinking, well, you know what? We have to fire our nuclear weapons at the U.S. before the U.S. completes their missile defense system. And so the Americans get into the thinking, well, we know the Soviets are going to want to fire nuclear weapons at us before we finish our defense system, so we better fire our nuclear weapons now. So suddenly you have incentives for both sides to fire their nuclear weapons. This is completely counterintuitive for a defensive system. The solution arrived at by the Soviet Union and the United States was the ABM Treaty in 1972, where they both agreed to limit the ABM sites to two. And then they had an amendment where it was limited to one, and the Soviet Union put their missile defense around Moscow, where it is there today, and the Americans shut down their last remaining site as completely unnecessary. So missile defense actually creates instability, a very paradoxical and unexpected outcome. Now we spoke before about the difference between immediate and general deterrence. General deterrence is when two states are not in confrontation because one state is so much weaker than the other that there is no active confrontation. And I gave the example of the United States and Mexico. Mexico, uh, it, its military power is significantly less than that of the United States. So there's not even a competition. Now, this actually has a special implication for nuclear weapons. The United States doesn't need more than, say, 100 nuclear weapons to destroy most of the cities in the Soviet Union that matter. Uh, after the main cities in the Soviet Union are destroyed, the cities get smaller and smaller and smaller uh, to the point where you're attacking very small towns with nuclear weapons. And so the amount of destruction you're doing with every subsequent volley of nuclear weapons has a significant drop in what's called marginal returns. So why do the major powers have so many nuclear weapons? Well, the U.S. doesn't have, or rather didn't have, thousands of nuclear weapons to deal with the Soviet Union. They probably had several thousand for tactical warfare purposes and extras, because many nuclear weapons would be destroyed during a nuclear exchange. But the U.S. had a very large arsenal, primarily for the benefits of general deterrence, because the larger the U.S. nuclear arsenal, the more confident were its allies, like Germany and Japan, uh, so they would then not have to go and get their nuclear weapons. And a very large nuclear arsenal also deters other countries, like, for example, Mexico or Brazil. These countries might compete if the U.S. only had 100 nuclear weapons. But uh, ultimately, the U.S. manufactured 71,000 nuclear weapons uh, between 1945 and 1992. And the U.S. is manufacturing one nuclear weapon every 50 minutes between 1959 and 1962, uh, which uh, uh, in those three years, the U.S. manufactured more nuclear weapons than every other country manufacturing nuclear weapons except the Soviet Union. So an enormous number. So nuclear general deterrence uh, is, is a very important motive for countries having large arsenals. So we have some political science questions about nuclear weapons. Do they matter? 
Well, one, nuclear weapons prevent the conquest of the state. They don't stop attacks, even against nuclear armed states. China attacked the United States in Korea between 1950 and 1953 at a time when the U.S. had a much bigger arsenal than the Soviet Union and China had no nuclear weapons at all. North Vietnam fought against the U.S. for eight years in Vietnam. Again, U.S. had nuclear weapons and the Soviet Union was not going to help North Vietnam in a nuclear war. The Soviet Union and China clashed in 1969. In 1973, Egypt and Syria attacked Israel which had gotten its own nuclear weapons in, the 19, in about 1970, 1968, 1969. Egypt and Syria knew Israel had nuclear weapons, but they knew Israel couldn't use their nuclear weapons, not without being completely isolated. So Israel was in some sense completely trapped. Their nuclear weapons were not so much for destroying Egypt and Syria because they couldn't use them until most of Israel was basically conquered by Egypt and Syria. Israel's nuclear weapons were to signal the rest of the world that it was going to go down to the fight and cause enormous disruption, and so other countries would have to save Israel. And again, Israel and Syria fought each other in Lebanon in 1982 and 1983. Argentina attacked uh, the, the Falkland Islands, a possession of England, which had, uh, which had nuclear weapons. So there are a great many cases where nuclear weapons didn't deter, but they do appear to be weapons of last resort, which means if a country is about to suffer conquest, it may credibly fire off the nuclear weapons. But then that's a worrisome, because if you think about a country like North Korea, when the regime falls in a large demonstration, for example, might not the leadership, Kim Jong-un, or whoever's in charge in Pyongyang at the time, see no difference between the fall of a whole country and a fall just of their family that controls the Communist Party. Well, nuclear weapons also create security. I mean, they create a margin of safety for diplomacy. When countries have nuclear weapons, they feel less of a need to move first. There's more time for dialogue and interaction. And this is partially what happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis. You can also trade nuclear protection for benefits from allies. The U.S. provides protection to Japan. Japan supported U.S. foreign policy through huge amounts of development aid throughout the Cold War. The U.S. wanted an ally to help it reinforce the international trading system, and Japan was America's number one ally for that. Nuclear weapons are incredibly cost-effective. They free up resources. Nuclear weapons typically cost about 10 to 15 percent of a country's nuclear uh, military budget. And uh, even if you factor in cleaning up the environment decades later, it almost never exceeds 30% of a defense budget. So nuclear weapons are incredibly cheap for what they do. Nuclear weapons also have swagger appeal. They bring status. It's not mere coincidence that the five Security Council veto powers, the United States, Russia, China, England, and France, all have the ability to mass produce thermonuclear weapons. Now it's believed that India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea can probably manufacture a thermonuclear weapon in a laboratory setting, but they're not in a position to mass produce them like the five major Security Council veto powers. Now there are some dangerous illusions about nuclear unusability. Some argue that nuclear weapons have made war unthinkable. This was actually stated by Nobel who invented a TNT. He thought TNT is so destructive we'll never have war again. But of course there was war. Uh, it was thought that after chemical weapons were used in World War I, having another war would be unthinkable. But World War II happened and Hitler and Churchill and Stalin simply agreed not to use chemical weapons. Others argue that common problems like the environment are going to compel countries to cooperate between each other. But natural disasters in the past, like drought, haven't always brought countries together, but have allowed one country to exploit another. Others have argued that economic interdependence 
has made it far less likely that countries would embark on a nuclear war. But in 1913, Germany and England traded more with each other than they would until 1970. In fact, Norman Angel, who's shown here in the bottom left, argued that war was very unlikely because of the level of economic interdependence. His prediction was proved false within a year. Countries, if they feel insecure, will always sacrifice their economic health in order to get more security. So there are risks associated with exercising the use of nuclear weapons. The first is that if nuclear weapons are used or a country threatens to use nuclear weapons too visibly, then it could accelerate nuclear proliferation. The problem is countries may realize that nuclear weapons are relatively easy to manufacture, very powerful on the battlefield, and very cost effective. And therefore, other countries would then want nuclear weapons. One of the biggest restraints on not using nuclear weapons and not threatening countries with nuclear attack in diplomacy is the concern that the major powers like the US and the Soviet Union would have their power eroded by other countries rapidly acquiring nuclear weapons. So it is in the interest of the large nuclear powers not to actually exercise nuclear diplomacy. Now for most states, only state survival is worth the cost of risking a nuclear war. However, a state may believe in the domino theory, the theory that the failure to defend a particular interest will result in a subsequent, subsequent cascade failure of all interests, because if a state concedes on one dispute, it's expected to be weak and will be challenged shortly after on other disputes. So states may put all of their power to defend the first issue. So for example, Taiwan poses a legitimacy threat to China because it's an alternate form of government that is an incredible threat to the legitimacy of the Communist Party in Beijing. So China may invade and try to seize Taiwan and the United States might stop Taiwan arguing that Taiwan is a fellow democracy. And this war may escalate. If China backs down, then they're going to be taken advantage of and the Communist Party will be targeted and overthrown like almost every other Communist Party has been. If the US backs down, it'll be a signal for Communist China to expand beyond Taiwan. So both sides might deploy tactical nuclear weapons. They might use tactical nuclear weapons. They might threaten to use theater weapons. They might escalate from tactical to theater applica applications of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon detonations under the oceans in space, and they may ultimately escalate to nuclear war between each other's uh, heartlands. Now there's a large normative debate about nuclear proliferation. Normative means what do you want to have happen? In other words, what's the norm or the value? There's been a lot of effort invested in anti-proliferation or non-proliferation arms control, uh, including the Partial Test Ban Treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, the 1968 Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, the Strategic Arms Limitations Talks, the Missile Technology Control Regime. All of these are designed to stop the spread of nuclear technology, missiles, nuclear weapons, and where nuclear weapons are deployed or used. Uh, there are nuclear free weapon zones. Uh, the great powers during the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union, uh, signed arms control agreements, the SALT talks, the START talks, to limit uh, the, the rapid growth in the size of arsenals of the different sides. It's believed that if there are too many nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons of the wrong type, or if nuclear weapons are deployed in unstable fashion, eventually nuclear weapons will be used with catastrophic consequences. In 1982, Kenneth Waltz wrote an Adelphi paper entitled More May Be Better, where he argued since nuclear weapons are such a powerful deterrent that they compel even politically radical regimes to moderate themselves, partially 
because to develop nuclear weapons, you must have a certain amount of administrative maturity. But also, once you possess nuclear weapons, you understand their destructiveness, and you generally become more restrained. And nuclear weapons make nuclear weapon states feel more secure. So radical communist Soviet Union, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, actually calmed down and became almost a status quo power. Communist China, that was asking the Soviet Union to immediately uh, provoke a nuclear conflict over the 1954-1958 Taiwan Straits Crisis, uh, itself in the 1970s became restrained after the Cultural Revolution. So Kenneth Walt seems to be right. All of these nuclear weapon states, once they acquire nuclear weapons, eventually moderate themselves, like India and Pakistan. And Kenneth Waltz makes the same prediction for North Korea. It's a compelling argument. Either you believe Kenneth Waltz, which is that nuclear weapons are incredibly robust, almost unusable, and therefore uh, you'll, you would not have countries with nuclear weapons start deadly wars against each other. So allowing nuclear proliferation should create world peace. Or you believe the arms control community who think more nuclear weapons are disastrous. Although the arms control community can't precisely explain how they see nuclear deterrence failing and a nuclear war breaking out. 